Welcome to Read This Book, the Summer Reading Edition. I am Lisa Von Drasic. I'm the curator of the Children's Literature Research Collections of the University of Minnesota. And joining me today is... Uh, Megan Coker, and I'm the curator for the Doris Kirshner Cookbook Collection, and also a science librarian for food science and nutrition, animal science, and soil, water, and climate. I'm Carolyn Bischoff. Uh, I'm the uh, physics, earth sciences, and astronomy librarian, and I, I'm over in Walter Library. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a read for an, an adult, actually. Uh -huh. um, kids might not want to read this at all. Um, this, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting reads of 2015. Um, the title is? The title is Dataclism. Uh -huh. And it's written by Christian Rudder. Uh, the subtitle, and I love this, Who We Are, asterisk, When We Think No One's Looking. Hmm. So Christian Rudder, um, is, was, uh, I think still is, um, works for OkCupid. Okay and this is a book that looks at the data from OkCupid okay and data from other major social media sites. Facebook is one. Um, they look at uh, other dating sites, things like that, and looks at things like relationships, things like attraction, um, at kind of a, a 30,000 foot level and kind of and, and, and looks at human behavior from a big data perspective. And I am just, I'm about, I think I'm maybe three quarters of the way through. I'm just gobbling it up because it's, um, it, 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 it presents data in such interesting ways and tells so much about sort of what we, who we are as people as people who interact with each other and build relationships with each other. I'm not, I don't, I'm not even doing it justice. Told, read this book, oh is my goodness, there, read this is book. Is there like a fact or something you discovered in there that you went, wow, I would never have thought that. There's something that's really interesting about relationship networks. Mm -hmm. So I'm making that sound more boring than it is. Um, he looks at how people know each other on Facebook and what that web looks like mm -hmm. and compares it to uh, how successful marriages are. So apparently he looks in a lot of different studies. So I, you know, I thought that OkCupid okay, data and Twitter data and Facebook data was locked down behind closed doors, uh -huh. not available for people, not true. There are oh. tons of researchers who use it to um, you know, learn about human relationships and learn about language and learn about the evolution of language. So one thing, one thing that um, really interested me was how, how successful marriages look as relationship networks on Facebook and what makes a successful marriage, um, you know, from a, from a very Facebook relationship perspective. Um, and it turns out that, um, that having two really interconnected webs that are connected by two people, a good marriage makes. Uh-oh. Isn't that interesting? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm like, so wait I'm, a minute, wait a minute. Uh, oh, I think the Venn diagram of my husband's and mine is like this, mm -hmm. like, teeny weeny. <laughs> So what's so interesting about that, so I'm recently married myself, and so, you know, I was, I was reading this, I was just telling my husband, hey, hey, come look at this. What do you think ours looks like? You know, I'm just wondering, yeah. So there's, uh, there's so much in here. Um, and, and looking at Twitter and the evolution of language. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I'm a Twitter user. I love mm -hmm. Twitter. And uh, w they found that the uh, big analyses of, like, Google Books, for example, and the common mm -hmm. words in Google Books, compared with the most common words in Twitter, Twitter has a much more rich ling language set of words, I guess, that are used in Twitter. There's less space to... Yeah, yeah. I don't believe that so because you, you need you, to be more precise. Mm -hmm. Did you really mean that word? And mm -hmm. it's probably better to use the more specific or not most popular. Well, mm -hmm. and you don't want to stuff it with fillers like yeah. the and your and uh and all this other stuff that uh -huh. appears in longer form books. Mm -hmm. um, just, um, it's like... Wow. It's okay, no, I thing get after that. thing is just so so interesting, um, and he's really critical of himself, critical mm -hmm. of how he's doing these analyses and how he's looking at things, uh. and it's very, it's it's really interesting, and lots of charts and graphs that it's he's great with data visualization too, so it's really it's so much fun. See, that's that why really I like this because there are books that I would never pick up, but now I'm like, well, like last time I bought four copies of that cookbook. <laughs> Did you get one for Christmas? Mm. I did not, but I got my own. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So, so we, what do you I'm, I'm going to switch up because I feel like Carolyn set me up for this. So <laughs> the, the next one I have is called The Language of Food by Dan Jurafsky. Uh, and this is where, where nerdy, word-loving people overlap with food, mm. um, which is my area for sure. Um, and this looks at how food has changed because of language or how, why we say things we do. Like the one example he gives in the introduction is, you know, why does this bottle say tomato ketchup? Like, isn't that a given? Why would you say tomato ketchup? And it's because this actually came from a Chinese word and um, it was two words, ketchup, and it, that means, I think, tomato and sauce. But the original condiment was a fish sauce a fermented fish sauce, mm -hmm. and it eventually changed and became, somebody added tomatoes to it, and it became tomato ketchup <laughs> as it got westernized. And, you know, as it came to America, it got lots of sugar and became, you know, the condiment that we know and love. Um, but things like that. So um, it also, you know, talks about um, why we call turkey turkey, and it's, you know, it, it, it does have to do with the country and birds. <laughs> it's really interesting. So just some interesting, fun looking at words and language and how the two have developed and changed each other, and, or food and language and how those two interact and change each other. So, Good pick. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I am That's something I want to read. Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am a <laughs> word <laughs> nerd, um, and, and I brought, <sighs> this is like no other book I know. And it's by Linda Berry. Barry. It's called Syllabus. Linda Berry is a cartoonist. Um, she so for 30 years. She's been a cartoonist. Her um, cartoons were syndicated, but she's of that not pretty, not funny, but daily life memoir cartoonist. More of a comic C O M I X person. Um, and this is Syllabus. Linda Berry notes from an accidental professor. And also when I think about summer, it's not that long. You know, <laughs> it's just a couple months and then we're back into the fall and the semester and the regular, I'm, I don't really mean to bring us all down here, <laughs> but it's true. And so when you're a kid, it's an opportunity to try new things. Maybe you've never been horseback riding. Maybe you've never um, seen the ocean or there's a trip to Washington, D.C. and you get to see the Capitol. These are the things summer is about in my mind. And here's an opportunity to learn from Linda Berry who has a class that she teaches. The, the course name is What is Class? And it's interdisciplinary science, humanities, writing, art. She has a class called My Unthinkable Mind. Again, interdisciplinary. She has a making comics class. She has a write what you see class. And she, inter she, she asks questions and you answer these questions and she spends an evening deciding who will be in this class with her. It's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And what I love about it is it is structure. It's a real class. It's a real class in, at the university. And as you know, your, your syllabus has a list of what your office hours are and what days the class is, but she also has expectations. Punctuality and attendance will matter a lot. No matter how much I dig your work, being late or absence will lower your grade. <laughs> <laughs> and any, any instructor anywhere knows that feeling when they get argued with about that. So and what does it the look like? Format, yeah is it's a composition notebook and her deliverables for her class are these composition notebooks. So each student starts with one and the expectation is you will fill three or four of these during the semester. And her assignments are very open-minded and free-form but also structured. There's a lot of poetry that the class students need to memorize. A lot of um, Emily Dickinson. Um, there's a sign reading, but there's also a lot of drawing and open lab time. And what I love about that, I just want to go to this page. 
she talks about how to build your notebook and how to try new things. And I'm thinking summer is about trying new things. And I'm telling you, I, I'm like, I feel like I want to buy a pile of these for everyone I know, especially people who are in a situation where we have an expectation of writing and producing. And um, how do you memorize? And what that does for your mind. And a lot of her research with her students is about how our minds work. Where does creativity come from? And a lot of the people who walk in with absolutely no art background. And so in this book, she also cuts and pastes her students' work. So this is her students' work. One class they walked in and she said, draw a burning house. Mm. And then you see all the different styles and ways. And for me, it was mind-blowing and mind-opening. I really like that you said, um, you talked about people needing to produce writing over the summer, because I immediately thought of you know, grad students and, mm -hmm. uh, who are working on their dissertations and theses and, and, mm -hmm. and faculty who, you know, this is their time to really work on their research projects. They're teaching through the whole semester, both semesters, and now this is the time to work. And this seems like, you know, I think, I think we've all had the feeling of like, man, I should be doing something else. I should be writing. Um, but this seems like a nice and excuse to read while you're trying to do and that. And it's a way <laughs> to kind of lighten that load. With You have that pressure, and she talks a lot about if you're sitting down and you have to draw and you have to write, you that's, that's when your greatest creativity isn't happening. But if you sit down with a notebook like this and a pen that you love and merely draw a spiral, put on some music, draw a spiral, you start loosening up the part of your brain that will allow new thoughts and new things and new synthesis to happen. And, that, and that's the research she's doing with these students. And she writes about assignments that didn't work, mm -hmm. like fill a piece of paper with crayon as, as hard as you can. And what she discovered when everybody came back to class is that everybody hates crayon. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what we discovered. We hate crayon. We hate crayon. We love blue line pencils. We hate crayon. Even my two-year-old hates crayon. Because really crayon, crayon <laughs> is really hard to use. <laughs> crayon. So where did your creativity stop? When do people stop drawing? One of the first things we give kids is crayon, which is a very hard thing to use. And then she has some, she has some, you know, coloring, <laughs> everyone coloring. So how to free up our creativity. So um, I feel quite inspired by Syllabus by Linda Berry for grown-ups and kids. Thanks. Yeah. It's a great recommendation. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your special picks for summer reading. And um, join us again for Read This Book.